cool. The person is good without much further ado. Uh, first formative. Here, here. Check, check. Am I audible? Can you hear me clearly? Loud and clear. Yes, sir. All right. We're going to subsidize universities or we're going to give funding for these universities based on how much graduates they can be employed in labor markets. Our parameter for how employability they are will be based on first, how much the job profession is highly demanded in job market, like whether or not those, uh, you know, those particular major have high market association or whether their partic that particular university have high, mar high job market absorption. And second of all, I think that uh, there will be a scale of priority like that this uh, you know this subsidy or this funding will be uh, given based on prop, uh, be, uh, proportionately and it, there will be rankings for example like the more employable your universities or your major will be the more subsidies or funding that you will get our model is simple first there will be constant update on each job fields to show the dynamic of job markets this is also to show the probability of obsolete majors like culture or historical studies or maybe philosophy to get high demand again we're going to like make it transparent also accountable for the public and also for the universities itself second of all the data that uh, show this dynamics will be managed by governments like information will be gathered through collaboration between NGO companies think tanks and also like government institutions especially in the tertiary education like all institutions will do their best on this calculation because they have and they want to have less employment rate that becomes a national problem so what opposition need to defend is they need to first defend equal subsidies why then all majors and all universities should get this equal subsidies. But, uh, but second of all, they also need to defend what uh, you know. What if people opt into obsolete majors, like majors that are already have low demand and status quo, like philosophy or cultural studies, or maybe library studies, things like that. So going to my first argument, why this method? Why is this uh, method of giving subsidy or funding is justified? First, why employable majors should be prioritized? I think that subsidies in education should be fair and it should be based. Uh, on two metrics. Firstly, contribution. Second, secondly, the effort that this particular major give. In terms of contribution, I think that these employable majors, they can reconstruct the structure of employment in society. They invent things to society. They create innovation. They are the one that create bigger, uh, biggest innovation and also in the fastest pace. Like they are the one that creating substantial contribution to society's well-being. Therefore, it's fair to for us to provide them more funding and also more subsidies. But second of all, in terms of effort, I think that they, these uh, these majors, the fact that they're becoming very employable means that they have a, good, a very good quality of research and also curriculum. That is to say, the effort that they put to create this qualified curriculum and also research requires lots of trial, trial and error to improve and they can result into qualified alumni. I think that this effort is the one that we need to appreciate the most. Therefore, the, the best way to appreciate this is by giving them subsidies. But second of all, I think that uh, this is justified because it's for the protections of the students. I think that we need to protect and compensate the resources that people give for entering college, especially to these employable majors, because expenses for education is super costly for people. Like they need to waste like three to four times, uh, three to four years of the time they have in their life and they cannot gain it back. They need to study harder. They also need to face the competitions uh, with other like talented students when they're you know, using when they're in the standardized testing for this university, they also need to put like energy, their mental capability to study, for example. And lastly, they also need to put money for paying tuition fees and so on. And this especially ap applies to, to people who enter highly competitive majors that is highly employable, like law, economics, or maybe medical studies that are they're currently very popular and also highly demanded by people. This is important to give them certain uh, to give these students certain up, uh, outcomes that is very certain in which is in terms of job that is to say like they need to have like a guarantee they will get sustainable career which is in the job markets itself they will not having trouble to gain uh, to gain jobs and also to gain income but second of all I think that more subsidies will make the students you know will compensate this effort in terms of like they will get better facilities they will have bigger the faculty itself or the major itself 
will have bigger capacity to absorb students. I think that this in itself will increase the employability of this uh, particular major or this particular <coughs> faculties. Like, I think it's going to be much more exclusive because in comparatively in South School, first, universities are settling for less because they don't thrive, they don't need to thrive harder to get subsidies. Like, because, the, because government are subsidizing them equally or they just rely on the, you know, <coughs> How much uh, alumni they can uh, they can generate things like that. But second of all, unis don't universities in style school also do not have to secure their students' future in terms of finding that the you know in terms of their uh, employability in the future. Like they don't have to thrive more to finding networks for their students or like doing much more for the employability of these particular graduates. So in conclusion, these arguments prove that it is justified to. Uh, you know, to ma to make the subsidy or the funding itself based on the metrics of employability, because first it fulfills the parameter of contribution and effort, but second of all, it's also giving better protection for students, for, for students, and also for for these majors for the uh, you know for the effort that they they gave for attaining these educations itself. Second argumentation: Why it's perfectly fine to leave out obsolete majors? I think that it's going to be a concession that in our side probably obsolete majors like history or cultural studies will be left out, or maybe they will not get uh, as much subsidy as majors like accounting or, or law or maybe medical or maybe medical studies. I think that firstly, exactly this method will incentivize the obsolete majors like culture and also history to thrive more and make themselves more employable. And how is it likely? Because first, there will have incentives in terms of competition, like they will want to repair their rank, they will want to, you know, increase their position that compared to other like more prospective major, for example. And second of all, there will also be criticism from alumni to defend that alum alumni, for example, like there's also criticism from external parties that will be like, uh, you know, there will be that makes them evaluate and also makes them want to be much more, uh, you know, willing to increase their, their quality and the output and how do they increase their quality will be first, maybe they will do more grounded research to prove the importance of their courses in the job market, for example. They're also doing check and balance inside of a curriculum. They make themselves more relevant to the job market and also to society. And lastly, they will also do innovation. They will create connections to companies, making them, making their alumni more employable in the future, in the future, and making like at least uh, you know trying to prove to society why their uh, their major is actually much more employable. But second of all, even if they fail, even if this incentive doesn't work, it's perfectly fine because it's because this proves to you that even giving them more subsidies will be useless anyway because these majors have less demand anyway. And it's hard to change this particular demand. I think that their graduates will not get secure jobs anyway in the opposition side of the house. So it's perfectly fine to let this, uh, you know, this obsolete majors to die or maybe to get less subsidy. Exactly, we need to to you know to at least educate people or educate these kids who want to enter you know university level and not encouraging them to enter these majors because it's going to be very risky for them because there's a likelihood that they will not get accepted in the job fields and things like that we're very proud to propose i thank that speaker very much i now very post negative yo, yo. Hey, am I am I on me? Am I choppy? Oh, uh, there's a bit of distortion. Maybe you can unmute yourself and or mute and unmute yourself. Um, how about this? Can you hear me now? Yeah, much much better. But uh, can other panelists confirm if there's distortion on their end as well, or is it just for me? I think it's clear for me. Well, I just as, as a check. Yeah, same. Great. Uh, best of luck. Oh, hello, hello. Yeah, you're audible loud and clear. Best of luck. Ah, okay. I'll start in the seconds then. The clash is simple. 
choice of the paper created. They were too large interest in the humanity still to the end. Okay, oh, it's hi, generally it's not, those that are not traditionally employable. Hi. This is oh, I'm sorry, oh. I really can't can't sorry. hear. I I just switched from my Wi-Fi to my hotspot, so it's some. Um, okay, none of us could hear you. I think you should begin again because uh, your voice was cutting. Uh, okay, let me try to fix it. Yeah, it's not only me. Thank you. Okay, is this any better? Yeah, it's much better. I just hope it stays like this. Just uh, keep a look on the chat. Uh, if your voice drops again, I think some one of us will text and I'll stop your time at that. Is that okay? Okay, okay, okay. All right, I'll start again in a few seconds. The clash of the simple, the first factor that is the choice of people to pursue whatever course they want, but two, that there is a larger stress in making sure the he stays alive and well in society. What is the alternative? Generally, we will sub courses that are not considered employable. We'll give equal, uh, generally equal thing to each of these courses. So that's going to be not, not traditional employable. I Equipment, labs, thing for society. So we say employ. Uh, okay. I, I'm really sorry, but your voice is dropping. It's really hard to follow. I can call Pep and then he can speak through my phone into the microphone. Sounds great. Is my voice clear? Yeah, as well, lucid as it can get. Well, at least there's something going for us, right? <laughs> Just give me a moment. <laughs> oh, maybe he can switch from Wi Fi okay, thank to you. And data sorry. or something. Pep, do you have data? Not at the moment, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll call you now. Can you can you give can you give me like some words, Pep? Okay, hello, hello, hello. I talked to my phone. Is this clear? Yeah, yeah, much better. Thank okay, you. just do it, Bob. Do it fast, so my I don't lose all my money. <laughs> Wait, so it is clear. Like you can. I'm not looking at the call right now. Yeah, it's clear. Okay, okay. I'll start in a few seconds then. Uh, message me if it's uh laggy again because I'm not looking at the room. Okay, so the clash is simple from negative. First, we protect the value of choice for people to pick what course they want to. Two, we protect the larger state interest in making sure the humanities are still a thing in society. Our counter proposal is that we will generally give equal funding to all of these different courses and departments. That's going to include not traditionally considered employable courses like history, English, policy at the undergraduate level. So obviously some courses are naturally a little harder to more expensive to teach. I mean some science departments require labs. That's not what it's about. It's generally just about uh, giving funding to all departments and making sure they have 
the funding. We say that employable industries like business or whatever, if they require more funding, should seek it from private corporations instead. These are really rich institutions and corporations that have an active incentive to get more better educated workers, right? So naturally, I think business schools in most parts and universities get a lot of funding from private sponsors. That means it will still be extremely accessible as an alternative for these people who want it. And so a couple of responses to the previous speaker. The first thing she said is about how it helps the people get a better future. We say choosing a course that is not traditionally employable is an informed choice because these statistics about employability are all publicly available anyway. And for most young people, this is pretty much the most important choice of your life. So you're likely to gather all information you need before you can make a decision. Therefore, if money is really your priority, you can still pick those courses. And it's not like we're banning people from taking those courses if they so please, but we pretend it's a choice. But anyway, we say because they're employable, they allow you to even have high starting salaries. So even if college is marginally more expensive, it's still a worth it return investment because you can make up that money from your first paycheck. The second thing is that they talk about it's more contribution and effort to society, therefore it deserves more. We think this is kind of offensive to people in the humanities. Like these people put lots of effort into their courses. Think of researchers who read hundreds and hundreds of pages trying to find out what happened in particular histories or political science majors who write all of these books about how political structures were in society. That's also really hard. And later I'll prove that the humanities generally has value in society, so they are putting a lot of contribution. So even if it's expensive, it's worth it given all of these contributions. Lastly, they talked about how this helps courses improve themselves because they want to get more funding. We say courses have a natural incentive to want to improve because they want to get more students, right? You want to become more popular, you want more people to pick your course. So that's already happening. Many humanities departments emphasize that it's not just a useless course, but they emphasize that they have different skills they learn. They can learn a skill of higher critical thinking, which does not exist in many other courses. So it's already something that's happening. I don't understand why it's necessary to further it even more. So my first argument is about choice of the person. I want to note that if the value of affirmative is getting a job, majority of skills for a job are learned on the job itself. Like working in a bank is so, so different from studying economics at college because real world applications are so specific that you are, need to be taught specifically what to do and you don't get any information simply from a college course. That's because undergraduate studies are just an introductory view of a field, not necessarily a professional view of the field and what you need to do as a worker. That means their like, uh, value of getting people prepared for jobs doesn't even happen because honestly, even an econ major isn't more prepared than a psych major when it comes to working at a bank because the skills are so different for every job. The second thing I want to note is that employability is a very recently created standard, right? The idea that business schools are sucking up funding of education because states see it as having a more direct return on investment. So we'd say that colleges should not just be seen as job preparation, but should respect the liberal arts and that colleges have a value of making people more educated and smarter about the world, right? So the context right now is humanities are already being underfunded and unadvertised. They're ready to kill it all together. So why then is choice important? We say people who have a passion for the humanities shouldn't be pressured not to pick it just because there are no more slots available, right? We say it is so crushing to do something you don't want to do for the money simply because you have to and there are no other slots for that. Because I recognize that this is a very big and important choice that will affect your life in multiple ways. What you do with your life, the connections you make, the job you're likely to have. That means people should have the right to do what they want given that like money is not the absolute value of the state. Remember, money is not the goal of life, but the goal is for people to find happiness and fulfillment. And if that happiness and fulfillment can only happen from taking a history degree that I enjoy more, we should allow people to take, to take that choice if they so please. And remember, if people want to pick an employable course, they still have the right to pick it. But we didn't say that people who pick other uh, employable courses if they don't want to won't even be very valuable in society. Because if you don't have a passion for your course, it's like you'll be very bad at your job because you have no passion to study hard for it. Remember, college is very tiring. It's very hard to excel. And these people need to be motivated in order for them to make these works to become better at their job. So likely people will go into courses they don't want to and not even be good at it in the first place. That's why we must protect their choice, not only for their own sake, but also to make sure they're better at contributing to society. My second argument is about how humanities are generally important on three levels. The first is morality, right? We say humanities teach you a wider scope for thinking to help you understand society. It is true, the study of history, of art, and of culture gives you tools through which you are able to understand yourself and gives you the means for you to introspect, right? I think many subjects like gender studies or black history, you are forced to consider the perspectives of other people, understand the struggles of different people in society. So it's like to teach you greater empathy, really understanding what other people are like and how they experience 
in the world. So two continents is here. The first is people are more fulfilled because they find means to which they're able to introspect and realize why or why they're not happy because of humanity teaches you these big questions like philosophy, why am I here, why am I on earth? So these people are likely to be more fulfilled. But two, they like to be better to each other because they understand the importance of being nice to other people. When throughout history, you can see so many examples of people being terrible to each other, you're more likely to be moral and to respect the choices of other people. The second reason is, we say there's a context of populism right now, of authoritarian leaders rising to power because people are unable to critically think. We say the ability to critically think and to question people in power is an extreme strength of having an educated humanities populace. An educated populace is the best safeguard against authoritarian power because they're the ones who are able to question the terrible rhetoric of people like Trump or Duterte. Society needs journalists who can call their abuses out. History majors who say that we're repeating history. So the only way we get people who are able to stand up against abuse in society, it's when we have people who are educated specifically to ask these questions and to look for these things. And because college people are an increasing segment of the population, it means it's a large demographic who have lots of journalists who are able to call these things out to abuse. The last part of this is sustainability, right? Because employability only talks about status quo, but the economy is constantly and increasingly changing. We see the context of the 21st century, it has 10 degrees, which they are probably talking about, are increasingly getting automated because corporations find more profit here and technology advances so quickly that they don't want to hire workers anymore. So we say it's not even a long-term policy because the only long-term jobs are jobs that use the one tool that can never be automated, the human mind. These are things only people can do, study history, study art, and it can never be automated. So if you actually want to prepare people for the future and prepare them for the economy of the 21st century, you have to help them hone these skills of culture, of history, which only they can do and robots cannot. My last argument is that employability as a standard is inherently biased towards capitalism because it creates a normative claim that getting money and achieving career success in your job is the most important thing in life. It encourages the narrative that it's okay to screw other people over if I get rich because of it. That's why big business, people who own the hedge funds, at the expense of the poor thing is justified because the educational system is fundamentally geared towards employability. So you won't want to call out systems of oppression from Amazon, you'll want to work for Amazon. That's because status quo is controlled by the elite who want to maintain the social society. So the only way to get people to they're not entrench this terrible non society that capitalism is inherently good is to teach people that employability is not the only standard in life. That's why we oppose. Thank you very much for that speech. And now in my second informative, here, here. Hello, Am I audible? Yes, you are. Let me just do a few clarifications before I enter my substantive. Um, I'm going to firstly clarify how does the standard of employability works in our sub house. Because I think there is some pushback coming from opposition when they talk about there is economy that is always changing, cannot predict the future. And that is the reason why in my first speaker argument, we already give the setup that this data is going to be compiled by government, by also companies, by also NGO, by also job market analysts to predict what kind of job that is going to be automated, what kind of job that's still going to be relevant in the future, what kind of job that's already obsolete. And it's going to be updated a few years. I think this is going to be made accurately. I think this is quite unfair for, for them to question this government fiat. 
But this question coming from opposition also nullifies their argument of talking about humanity is important. Because when they talk about currently job is being automated and economy, science is automated, therefore we need to have more human aspect, therefore we have to have humanity, like entertainment, like social studies and gender study. If the uh, aspect of technical issue, for example, technical courses like economy, like science and mathematics is going to be automated, exactly we need this data, exactly we need the employability standard so we can have more humanity um, of course, it's being provided in the future. If that's the data is going to be saying that the kind of job that's going to be obsolete is these technical uh, courses and the one that's not going to be obsolete is humanity courses, therefore we we actually is to are the one that is going to be targetedly create more or more you know seats in the university for humanity courses. But this uh, setup also responded also responsive to their argument they talk about there is already private donors towards the job that is already have a lot of employability in the future notice that this employability standard is going to be used by the government to to you know complete what is currently missing because the reality right now we have a lot of demand in economic courses for example but the kind of the, the number of seats in university is not enough to respond to the demand in the market therefore if the private donors if it's already existing and there is already enough seat, then government will not increase the amount of budget, will not, in, will not increase the amount of subsidy towards this particular sector. This debate operates in a scenario, how if the kind of, the number of jobs needed by the market is not, you know, is, is more than the number of seats in university for that particular courses. So two things, first, protecting the interest of potential university students, Second, talking about competition between courses. First, protecting the interests of potential university students. They talk about protecting the choices of individual students to give them value, to give them happiness in choosing and having agency on what they want. I'm going to respond this in several layers. The first is, to some extent, we are still protecting some degree of potential students and some varieties of university courses because we are not going to completely abolish the humanity programs we are also we are only going to create standard of uh, and scale of priorities if because in south korea now we recognize there are some demands in humanity courses we still have some seats in humanity courses in university but it's based on the data but we, we even if the number is limited but we're going to ensure that the one that go to the humanity courses are the one that are more cap most capable the one that are most suitable because the comparative in their sub the house they there are a lot of people that are going to get unemployed in the future because they take these humanity courses second even if we cut and abolish this humanity uh, you know courses we told you that it's okay because maybe it is important for us to prioritize economy and prioritize science degree first because we face a project of how to manage this economic crisis, how to create more financial incentive and government program of subsidy towards rural area. Or in science degree, how we are going to overcome the issue of climate change and scarcity of resources, something that's going to be objectively benefit the society on the ground. I think we cannot trade off that. The third, the third response to this is we have to understand um, that uh, people that can access um, people that can access these choices are not the kind of people that you want to protect in our sub the house. Because notice, if you really want to go to humanity study, despite it has low employ low employability, uh, um, you know, a standard, you can still go there. But this is not the type of vulnerable individuals that we want to protect. This is only rich people that can bear the consequences if they go to humanity courses and they're going to get unemployed in the future. And I think it's right now, it's not that people can have choice because they don't be able to, you know, go to a uh, science degree or economic degree because limited seats, because it means that in their side of the house, some people are also being having their choice being taken away. Lastly, then they talk about happiness of the people to choose. I think sure you got to have a short-term happiness on your side of the house but in the future when you are getting unemployed because you don't listen to this unemployability employability standard you are going to be much more sad in the future because you cannot fit your family you cannot have disposable income to invest in for what for you know in 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 in, in, in housing for example so i think this is important because the kind of people that we want to protect in our the house are the majority of the people, not only the rich people that can bear the consequences of getting unemployed in the future. We told you in the first speaker that a lot of time, university 
uh, advertise something that is sometimes misleading. For example, they capitalize on the alumni that gets become successful in some companies instead of revealing the overall rate of employment. Sometimes they get a lot of exposure in, in media that makes and that clouds the judgment of potential students to come in. Therefore, the utility of giving giving people jobs and leading people to get the best decision in their life, something that is the a priority a priori in this particular debate that you cannot trade off. Um, second of all, how does this proportional subsidy, uh, you know, makes the uh, curriculum in the university becomes much more better? We suggest that the university has an important role in influencing the dynamics and availability and also diversity of job market absorption by creating research, journal, and think tank or creating innovation to open up more uh, jobs. So the problem is at the school, the equal funding that exists between different plethoras of courses will create perverse incentive in creating this breakthrough innovation because they are still going to be funded anyway, even though you know they don't create a lot of innovation. How do we change this? Because we are going to change the incentive structure of the boards of directors of university, the professors, the teachers, to push the students to create research uh, or um, or. or or to, to maintain the relatability of how employable they are in the future by being more practical and being more beneficial in the future. How does this look like? This looks like energy engineering fac faculties courses will be pushed to create new types of method to process oil extraction products in the face of oil scar scarcity. Accounting in the face of automation is going to create a breakthrough innovation how human aspect in accounting is still necessary, for example, in some startup culture or social science. Exactly when they talk about, you know, humanity, gender study, social study is important to uplift the, the life of minority in the ground. We told you that in our sub house, if you want to protect minority, I think the best way is to give them jobs that are employable because a lot of, a lot of African American, a lot of women don't get enough seats in university because there are less starting point by having them being employable in the future at least they have disposable income and we protect their life but even when you talk about university courses and in relation towards minority group i think it's better in our sub house because in our sub house gender study and social study needs to be practical for example to create you know more decision in the government how to uplift minority on the ground instead of only talking in a philosophical ground because they want to be relevant because they want government to create more funding in these particular courses. That's the reason why we mechanize and we practicalize the kind of social study and gender study that exists under the house. Very proud to host. Thank you very much for that speech. I now invite second negative here. Hello, Hello. Hi, can I be heard? Yep. Okay. Sure. Let me just fix my speech. Let's be crystal. We told you this debate already operates on a context where there is already a global arc towards the development of sciences to the detriment of humanities. Why? Because he told you there is already currently existing natural incentive for undergraduates to choose courses that benefit and profit them. And because society is already capitalistic, STEM courses, whether or not you fund them, will get more and more people flowing into them. And this highlights the trade-off, right? Even if in our worst cases, STEM courses get slightly more expensive, students that want to join to STEM can still enroll because their immense employability means a greater ability to pay off things like student debt and loans, which makes most of their harms fall away on how we need lots of economists because we gave you loads of material like again, like how on how humanities students are negatively impacted.
with this. I'm going to do three things in my speech. A, general rebuttal. Secondly, focusing on the utility of liberal arts and humanities. And thirdly, a quick extension on the perverse incentives for college departments to become racists. On to rebuttal. The first thing they claim is, ah, innovation. We need to pressure departments to do better by funding them. Firstly, we gave you several structural reasons why this innovation and want to not be complacent exists on whether or not you fund them. A, departments are already awarded funding based on how well ranked they are compared to other departments and other schools in society, which means that there is always an incentive, for example, for Yale University to, to say, we are the best accountants, number one in the US, and Harvard to say, no, we are the number one in the US. Secondly, departments are awarded the funding on the quality of research, like the amount of citations they have, which means that people who are faculties will want to continuously improve prove the, themselves, regardless of whether or not we fund them on employability. But thirdly, we tell you, and this is not responded to, employability is already a huge draw, regardless of funding, because lots of people want to just get their family out of poverty, as you said, which means that whether or not like we give you subsidies because you are able to make back the money you pay for college in five years, you more and more people will probably go to your side, which means that any added funding to these courses are likely to be incredibly marginal. The second thing they say is, ah, but it's expensive to develop, develop curriculum. We say that's symmetric to all courses, but we tell you that given equal funding from the university, all courses can advance at the same pace. But we tell you that in status quo, employable courses already get more funding from A, private companies that want to give partnerships in order for them to get the best like alumni. Secondly, rich alumni like Bill Gates, for example, that want to fund these courses because they want to come back and they want names and buildings to be named after them. If you buy their characterization that these courses are more employable, then their alum are probably going to be much richer and therefore give back more and more money. But thirdly, there are naturally instead of naturally occurring incentives, for example, for companies to want to partner with these universities because there are positive incentives to, for example, want to get more and more people into your company, which means that in comparison, humanities is on its last legs and on a decline. This policy leaves them to die versus most of the high tier employable courses that already get so much funding in status quo and that impacts the way they're able to impact their arguments because now when they say we need more economists we say actually there are so many people in science and technology fields already in society there is actually an overflow of nurses because more people go into stem than actually need to because they are convinced by employability so for all those reasons their harms flow away the second thing i want to talk about in my speech is the utility of liberal arts and humanities we told you that this system only perpetuates sexism, racism, inequality, and oppression because oftentimes liberal institutions are the bastions of society. They are at the forefront of the change. Famous works from humanitarians like Martin Luther King, for example, or Malala Yousafzai, gender advocates, are the ones that tell society to be more equal to begin with. The characterization we told you was that now they will, like the most oppressed in society, are no longer able to be afforded entry into humanities. Not the comparative here, right? They say rich people don't need funding to enter the humanities. We agree with them. We say that whether or not you fund these courses, rich people will be able to afford these institutions. But we tell you that because humanities, for example, isn't very employable, then people who are very, very poor and want to enter, for example, into gender studies to fight for feminism are now no longer able to opt into feminism because now it is too expensive for them because they were on the knife's edge of going to a feminist course or to something more utilitarian. What do we tell you? What are the impacts of this? When they say you had to save the economy, we told you that societal issues were more than just whether or not you had economists in the market because he told you that there is only a marginal change on their side. 150,000 economics graduates versus 200,000 graduates. We tell you that there will, be, there will still be award-winning economists on either side. But when you turn 50,000 humanities graduates, because humanities is already declining, so just 3,000 humanity graduates, there might be no longer any Martin Luther King juniors. We tell you that the comparative here is societal issues are also like philosophical issues, like for example, whether or not the United States should be protectionist or free market. You can't just adjudicate that based on how much money goes through because you also have to look at how this affects different social classes and to affect that you have to go into black person studies to see how Black Lives Matter, for example, are uniquely affected by these policies. Or for second, secondly, climate change. It's not enough that you have award-winning economists on the board because there is a philosophical debate on whether or not we should prioritize present generations versus future generations when adjudicating whether or not to pass these 
these particular policies, which means and goes to show that humanities plays just as a crucial role as economists. But even if you believe that economists are more crucial than human, huma, the humanities, we tell you that because of the current societal trends towards people wanting employability, there will always be so many more human like science people on their side. The difference between 170,000 graduates versus 200,000 graduates is marginal when it comes to um, sciences. But when it comes to humanity, there's a large difference between 10,000 tenured professors and 1,000 tenured professors, right? The last thing I want to talk about are perverse incentives for college departments. And this is my extension. We tell you that when employability is a metric, Note their frame is very predatory. They say we, we will rank you by department, which means that there is a zero-sum game in university where professors and the research and whether they get to keep their jobs is premised on how employable the course is. I think that's when you make courses more sexist and racist. Premise one, employability is probably going to be the percentage of students employed in the first two years. Premise two, there are strong societal norms that allow majorities to get advantages over minorities like all boys clubs leading to for example networks of employment and hiring that allow you to get into for example mckinsey secondly implicit hiring biases but thirdly racism which means that white cis men are probably going to be more likely than not to be hired than the minority population so thirdly if there are 200 slots in your university you are not going to maximize the least qualified you're going to maximize the most qualified which means that you, whether or not you are accepted is based on how attractive or white you are because that necessarily impacts whether or not your course gets the funding that it needs to, to survive, which hurts the minorities that government wants to help and takes down their benefits because now you incentivize the ability for your universities to justify only getting white cis men and not people in the minority. And we think that is incredibly terrible and sexist. But secondly, I think it just makes society worse off, right? Because when you say you invest less money in a major, that also means you have less, for example, tenured professors. So you, you are less likely to offer minors a common core curriculum. A, that means less humanities in STEM, which means that they cannot co-opt having same, some, some humanities classes in STEM because there is so little faculty now that they cannot do university-wide degrees. But secondly, the course itself will no longer have moral discussions because business ethics, for example, in accountancy won't get you employed. So there's a negative incentive to do this, which means A, there will be less moral experiments in biotech, which means that like people will be abused. But secondly, the individualistic conception of a job because now we are no longer to appreciate, as Chidi from The Good Place says, what we owe to each other means that people are going to be more tribalistic and animalistic. This looks like rich Wall Street hustlers shorting companies and making hundreds of thousands of people unemployed because all they want is to be employed. Or secondly, consulting firms, for example, messing up Saudi Arabia and South America because all they want is to be employed and maximize their own utility without necessarily pondering on the philosophical impacts that they're terrible policies have on people, which makes society more unequal, more biased towards the majority, and therefore, we should not support this policy. Negate. I thank the speaker for that speech. I now invite to a deformative. Here, here. Test test, am I audible? Louder and uh, loud and clear. Test loud. Okay, wait a minute. I need to set my timer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, look how inexclusive and unrealistic the benefit that negative team wants to have. Firstly, they want to have the next Martin Luther King. People would have would have would uh, people that have high social like uh, uh, social utility, the people that care about social issues and whatnot. But the question then becomes why is it exclusive to uni graduates or uni students to begin with? Because if you really wanted to have like social issues, engagement and whatnot, we say that those campaigns are not reliant or contingent upon university students or those courses in the major. Because those campaigns are from people who are act who are activists who are like facing the cruel reality themselves without necessarily having the major to begin with. So this is so having social justice is not exclusive through people who wanted to have this major to begin with. So they never prove why then the existence of these courses to have the same amount of subsidy is is like co is correlating with the idea of social activism that they wanted to have because other platform exists social media activisms and all thought so do 
to care about social issues, we say it's not exclusive. But second of all, they suddenly talk about morality, right? But I don't get the correlation why then morality would suddenly be gone when you don't subsidize this university who talks about morality. Because the set of morality exists in both sides of the house. Because it doesn't, like, it, it is not a clean slate debate that people have developed their own morality. Therefore, like, experimenting human being is agreed upon to be wrong. Therefore, that even if we don't have a philosophical major, we would still not do that anyway because there is a social a social agreement that is something wrong. So basically, the, the thing about morality is something that is exclusive on their side of the house. So philosophical discussion within the university ground are not necessarily exclusive because there are some certain social discussion that exists outside of it that are also important. But before moving to my substantive, one clarification, right? So the extension coming from the second ne second negative is talking about how then th how then you would be more racist and inequal and sexist at gathering the students. I don't get why then that's the case, right? Because what we want on our side house is that when we have more subsidy to this business major, therefore we have more quotas for people to enter. That's exactly why the people who have less privilege were more likely to have access and chances to get into that. Therefore, it is a fair treatment on our side house. I don't get it why then it would be otherwise on their side of the house, right? So two things in my speech. One, I'm going to talk about why then employability of graduates is a fine parameter. A second of all, let's talk about the protection of this uni university students, right? So first of all, why then this is a correct parameter? So what we say is that university courses that have high employability of graduates done two things. First, it makes it means that they have curriculum to make a quality graduate that is contributive to the workforce. But second, they have res researchers to prove what to, to prove to the company and to the government to why then these particular courses are relevant to the society. The case in point IT major to prove why then technology is an integral part of the world, hence the increasing of the demand of IT graduates, right? So the response, so we said that, that those two reasons means that they have more effort, they have more like the effort to be appreciated. The response coming from them saying that, no, 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 in status quo, that there's a lot of company investment goes to this. This is not enough of response because it doesn't negate the fact that government still needs to appreciate this because the impact also goes to the government, hence things like how then the uh, people will not be unemployed because they have a quality grade to be relevant in the job market. But second of all, the you, company's investment is not necessarily something there is not a form of appreciation because it is some they expect something in return, right? Such as contracted uh, contracted work for these graduates and whatnot. It's not necessarily an appreciation for you to uh, of making this effort. While we say the struggle is hard, the argumentation is important because, irrespective of the outcome, we said that this appreciation is something government always done when you give tax break to company because you're contributive to the society. When you give a lot of institution tax breaks and whatnot because it gives a niche benefit that you don't give. This is exactly why the benefit of you to create more employability graduates are something should be appreciated. This argument, uh, this principle argument is independent and should be granted. It should. Be be counted. But second of all, the good protection of university students, right? So basically what they're trying to protect is that student needs to the students that wanted to learn about humanity will be sacrificed because they will have uh, no spot and whatsoever. First response to this is that there's no harm at all on our side house because these courses still exist but with less subsidy. It's fine because the interested the uh, the people who are interested in this major are small in number. Why is that the case? It is effective towards the employability rate because when pe less people are interested in that major, it means that the relevance within the job market or the trend or within the society are also, are also less in number. So we say with the existence of uh, uh, courses on our side house with less minim with minimum of budget is still fine and they're not sacrificed. But second response, if you really wanted to talk about how then we need the uh, activism, like the research of African-American culture, research of feminism, gender studies, and whatnot, we say that if it's, re if it's really the case, then there's no problem at all. Because if the social issue is that big, therefore the job opportunity to have technocrats in the parliament, to have more NGOs member, therefore the employability rates of these graduates from this major will be big anyway on our side of the house, right? Exactly because of that, we said that there's no problem whatsoever for these students who have the interest in humanity. But exactly because that we say that if this, this, uh, this yeah. major is important when they have small budget, the incentive to have more innovation exactly exists. Why then this is better fulfillment rather than on their side house? Because the first speaker contest about fulfillment, right? Because firstly, the fulfillment of you having 
to struggle more to find the identity meaning or philosophical philosophical meaning of social issues are more meaningful when you when you struggle to it are more meaningful when you try creative ways to embrace your culture and to share it with people this is exactly why the sense of fulfillment of the students on our side of the house are far more better comparative to that but even if you have to sacrifice this individuals on these majors it's perfectly fine because who do we protect on our side of the house who the, the people the person that we protect on our side of the house are the most vulnerable individual are the individual are that uh, irrespective of their gender and their uh, culture and whatnot, but those are vulnerable. We're talking about middle to low class society that have no like capability or have no uh, privilege to choose what they want to be, but to have money on their hand. But, but these people are not the people who are smart enough to be able to compete with the idea of scholarship given by McKinsey, right? Because this is exactly why proving why then like capital investment from companies not enough because there are some requirements that are too high for this middle to low class to, of, to, to student to attain to. This is exactly why the subsidy in and of itself is really important to protect this individual because we increase the quota, we increase the accessibility of this individual for them to be able to get the same chance of survivability. Why then this argumentation is really important? Because comparatively to have another matter to Luther King Jr., we are more realistic in giving food for people who need them uh, who need them instead of solving patriarchy within the society because it's also unclear why then having this major suddenly social problem will be solved right but at least we've proven to you why then this vulnerable individual have an increase of rate of survivability of their life because they are they they are able to get into major that could guarantee employability to their side of the house because on their side of, of the house these people who cannot enter to this unit to this major who have higher in employability because maybe they're smart they're not smart enough or they don't have a privilege to get tutor outside of the college or school for instance will eventually be stuck in a in a in, in a condition that is desperate because they have no access and chances to repair their life on their side of the house so it is really important because we really take to care about the problem that there is more imminent, there is more realistic on our side. I was very proud to prepare. Thank you very much for that speech. I now invite Todd Negative here. Hello, Todd. So I'll discuss two things. Firstly, does their policy help the individual student? Secondly, does it benefit society? So firstly on the individual, I want to address a cheat idea they had, right? So in response to our idea of automation, which was that what is employable now may very likely not be employable in the near future because of the complex and unpredictable effects of automation and AI upon our economy. Well, they say we'll have an equally complex algorithm which predicts perfectly in the future, every single thing that will be employable. Well, I mean, I think we can reasonably call out that this is an insufficient and unreasonable use of fiat because currently we are able to know what is employable using current statistics, but like the amount of government funding and research and computing power necessary to predict what is employable 10 or 20 years in the future simply does not exist. And I'm not really sure that's a debate that really is happening, right? Moreover, if they want to claim the benefits of scientific benefits in particular, then they must remove this response because they all this response assumes that they're going to be funding humanities in the future or humanities currently anyway but finally um what we would say is that it, it, raises the, it raises the question like how far in the future are you looking because what you're saying is the skills which will be employable will be different 10 or 20 years in the future so will they prioritize employable skills now or employable skills in the future it's unclear precisely because it's unclear we, we argue that employability is therefore an inconsistent standard and one that is unlikely to be consistent over time and therefore one you should not choose but next i think an issue which under the individual's benefit, which we clearly win, is the issue of, well, am I going to be able to afford going to this course if I want to join an employable course, right? Because we gave to you so, so, so many alternatives for these places to get funding. We said that large corporations, who by the way are going to be the ones who most of these people end up working for, have the large incentive to make sure that these places get funding. So if the state does not, then these places will. And moreover, if those places don't do it, then rich alumni will. And if rich alumni will not do it, then the sheer fact that the most number of students tend to go to these courses means that they have the most intuition fees. Which means that like, it's not really clear to me why 
exactly the added value of the state is so necessary when there are so many other factors which are going to mitigate it, right? And even if it is, the fact that there are so many other people who are already funding these courses means that the added marginal funding of the state is lower. Compare that to adding funding to a course which nobody is funding at the end of the day. Anyway, the marginal increase in value is so much greater because there is so much less funding to begin with. A 100% increase instead of a 50% increase. Moreover, an issue we win here is the idea that whether or not an individual who goes into a non-employable course can still be employed in the future. Because what did our first speaker tell you, which was unrebutted? He told you that oftentimes the skills which you need to enter a bank or the skills which you need to enter any sort of um, professional job are very, very different than the introductory and basic views which are oftentimes taught inside these courses, such that oftentimes it is the passion which you get from these courses and not necessarily the full extent of information. What this means is, is that if I'm a psych major, I can still probably go to a bank, right? I can still probably go to any other course Course, which will teach me what I need to learn on the job anyway. So because that is true and because that's, uh, that's un uh, that is unresponded, then every single benefit they have about the benefit of more people working in certain industries is a wash because we are able to prove to you that you can still work on these industries even if you didn't take an undergrad course in those industries. But next, they say principally, right, the individual must be allowed, must be subsidized more because of the fact that, well, they're going to be unemployed in the future. That's really, really bad for them, right? Well, another unresponded argument is that for some people, the risk of being unemployed is something they're likely to take. For some people, they can make the informed, rational choice while thinking about what course they want to do, that maybe there is a higher percentage chance that I will not get a job right away if I am taking this course. But I love theater so much, I love history so much, I love philosophy so much, that I am willing to take that chance. But that chance and that opportunity is robbed from every single individual who is denied a high a barrier towards going to that course due to the high tuition requirements. Those high tuition requirements, by the way, are not present for highly employable courses because of the fact that we have so many other sources of funding. So what we say is the issue of choice falls squarely upon our side because those individuals are barred from making a choice that means the most for themselves. And the state cannot objectively say that a 10% ch more chance to be unemployed is equivalent towards the, 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 the chance to equivalent towards losing the chance to ever practice your passion at the end of the day anyway, right? But even if that's true, they did not prove that it is objectively more utility to me to be unemployed, to be unemployed versus unemployed, right? Many individuals would rather be unemployed for a while, but be able to create art, but be able to read history books, which they love as a means of studying, right? I think that comparatively upon their side, by assuming a single form of utility, they must fail if any other form of utility except getting money is even slightly plausible for you. And I think that's likely because obviously there are other ways to enjoy life. And I think that the arguments finally that schools will become better and therefore change because of this do not respond to my partner's arguments on the incentives of schools, right? Because for minority individuals especially, this policy is very, very bad because it's not just that quotas will increase and that more individuals are going to get hired, but that employability specifically is the standard which you will use in order to make sure people will get hired. And guess what? Certain types of people are less employable. Women are less employable. Black people are less employable. Not because of ability but because of the biases of society. But because schools have to compete against each other for funding, they will then deprioritize individuals who society has deemed less, less employable for unjustified reasons because of that funding scheme. Therefore, their schools will replicate the biases of society. For all of these reasons, for majority individuals who simply want to have a choice, for minority individuals who are going to be denied the chance to enter any of their choices, we think that we've won the issue on individual um, capacities and, and individual benefits. Secondly, on societal benefits, I want to address two cheat responses here. The first from the previous speaker, actually the, the first two from the previous speaker was that, oh, morality is easy and, and addressing large social issues it's very easy, right? We don't need to study these things. This is false. The reason why gender studies exist is because oftentimes the oppressions of individuals are very, very hard to dissect and understand. The term intersectionality, which is so useful in understanding not only the oppression of Black individuals, but individuals at, at intersections of gender, race, and um, class, 
came from the academic world. And it is so useful for us to understand that, wow, there are different types of oppression which exist and it has changed the, the way that um, social movements act. You are losing these benefits by losing the capacity for, um, social, um, for social studies and gender studies to meaningfully impact the world, right? So we don't think these problems are easy. They're in fact some of the worst problems in society. Moreover, secondly, we don't think they've given us a concrete or objective definition as to what utility is and what society always needs. We concede that climate change is probably a bad thing, right? But we don't think they've given us sufficient weighing to say that climate change is the worst possible harm as compared to gender disparity, as compared to the harms of racial violence which currently exist. And we think that the academic sphere integral as it is to solving these problems and addressing them, therefore must be able to equally solve most. So what would you rather side with, right? We would rather side with a side which is able to prioritize the, which is able to provide attention towards problems such as racial violence, such as sexual inequality, as well as providing a large amount of attention towards things like climate change and things like world hunger, or a side which puts all its eggs in one basket and has not justified why their problems are the most important. We think we have engaged every single side of this debate by co-opting their harms and showing you why they can still be solved upon our side. They have not extended us the same courtesy and therefore they must lose this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech, speaker. I now invite the negative reply. Here, here. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Am I choppy? Is my internet still trash? Should I have to take home again? Hey, you got better. I'm proud. Yeah, of it's you much better. better. It's a miracle. Go ahead. <sighs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll start in a few seconds. If you pick a science course because it's the only choice offered by your school and you don't actually like science, you're probably not going to be very good at it. You won't have the passion to study hard and study always. You're going to get easily burnt out because you don't enjoy what you're doing. That's why affirmative can't claim the benefits of all of the societal improvement because they never proved why these people would necessarily be productive members of society in a course that they hate anyway. That's important because their arguments are dependent on these people being competent, really great workers. If we disprove that link, that means they can't claim any of these benefits. But if the question is jobs, like working in a bank or working in specific industries, we can just give them on the job training anyway. So it's easy for us to get like a psych major and make him the head of a bank because he still has skills that we can specifically teach him for that job. So for those instances, they never proved why college education is even necessary. But I think our main point here is that getting more money and getting a nice job isn't the goal of life. It is merely a means to an end of finding fulfillment and happiness with your life. I think it's crazy for them to say that having a job immediately means I'll be happy because for many people, it's simply not the case. That's why like people can find joy Uh, I've lost him. Even if they're not super rich and that they're doing what they will be okay. Uh, okay. Um, is it your still choppy? Was, can you... Your last word was they can find joy. Uh, yeah, I lost you after goal of life is fulfillment. Productivity may not be happiness. And like that was 10 seconds ago. So I didn't hear the last 10 seconds. Okay, okay. What time did I stop? Like you stopped at one minute, one minute, eight seconds. Okay, okay, okay. I have three minutes left. Okay, I'll start again uh, from that point. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lie that having a job immediately means you'll be happy because many people can find joy and fulfillment through doing what they love, even if they aren't rich, right? And we say this is even a calculated choice. Sure, there might be some people who are willing to sell their souls to corporate and will will still be able to work hard. But those people only for themselves can determine what they want and what is best for them, right? So people can still make that choice if they so choose. But on affirmatives world, people can't make that choice when these departments are likely not to exist anymore, given the global decline in the humanities and the fact that you're withdrawing the very few funding that these people even have. Next, societal problems. I think a malicious term that affirmative use was the phrase objective benefit. Like there is any objective benefit in the world. Like guys, why do we debate? It's because we don't know what's the most important issue. And I could very much say that gender inequality and patriarchy are much more important issues than climate change. We say that there is a trend even that humanity can become so concerned with what we can do, with expanding what we can do, but not stopping to ask if we should do it. And that's why we argue 
you that the integration of science and other fields like morals and ethics, business ethics are extremely important so people understand if what they are doing is even a right thing in the first place. And I think it's crazy for them to say that we have social agreements about what is bad. You mean the social agreements coming from the racist and bigoted society that already exists? Likely, there's even a predisposition towards being racist, towards being bigoted, that we need colleges to unlearn these very complex biases that we have towards other people. And they never responded to my argument, which I like, about how entrenching norms of capitalism will happen. The idea that getting a job is the most important part of your life is a biased statement. It's, it's, it's in and of itself a political opinion. But you're entrenching it by saying and make a normative claim that having a job and achieving career success is the point of life. That's why people won't want to critique Amazon. They'll want to work for Amazon. So all of the oppression that exists in status quo becomes harder to call out the point at which people are not educated to ask questions of critical thinking and to critique these structures of power that harms so many people. Generally, I think they have not responded to the many benefits of humanities we're always giving throughout our case. The idea of morality, how it helps you be a better person because you understand the struggles of Black people and women. The idea that you help you find yourself more because it gives you tools to introspect, to understand yourself more when you understand history and culture and how you're affected by those things. I think the idea that people can be happier and better people is a huge benefit that they haven't responded to, except for the weird response that MLK didn't need a degree. I mean, I wish we were all as smart as K, but for most people, we'll need someone in college to teach us these things, as frameworks to understand the world. I'm not that smart. I needed college to teach me those things. Lastly, unresponded to is this huge impact about racism. Because the basis is employability, and certain people are more employable, like white people are more employable, colleges will likely admit more white people because their funding is literally dependent on having the most employable graduates. So you're likely to skew admissions towards privileged people who don't even need it, therefore this de depriving the entirety of education and tertiary education to vulnerable, and vulnerable minorities who need it the most. So there are so many issues in the debate, but I think that we clearly win all of them simply the fact that they're not responding to many of our I thank that speaker for that speech. Thanks for it being without glitches. I now invite Af reply. Oh, is that formative reply here? Yeah, I'm I'm here. Oh, sh cool. I don't think that the debate about how much this standard is going to be able to predict the future is something that is relevant. Because sure, we cannot predict what happened to, at best and that's how the house, we cannot predict what happened in the 20, 30 years in the future, but at least we can still predict the kind of changes that might occur in the workforce the next 10 and 15 years. And at, it means in our sub house, we can ensure people are going to be employed in a medium to long-term uh, account that is the reason why there the argument about how a lot of people are going to be unemployed under the sub house still makes sense so first thing utility and function of university they talk about humanity studies that need to be subsidized more because of the utility of social morality because they want to have another martin luther king that can make society becomes more progressive we believe that the third half or they taught you that if you want to advocate about moral and social issues you can still be knowledgeable about that issue and Advocate that because you can still self-learn through activism, through social media discussion, and relate to the minority. Even Martin Luther King does not come from racial African-American school. He comes from theology school. But what is really important is to protect the, you know, the condition of general society and to solve the condition of general issue. For example, economic crisis, negotiating parties and warfare to prevent collateral damage or to innovate the uh, to innovate, to create better resources in, in times of scarcity resources in society right now. This argument is much more important because we protect more scope of people. They talk about protecting the minority on the ground. First of all, we told you 
that we open up more access to the minority that is currently being not able to access the quote the quotas but the response is only talking about how currently in in the in our sub the house men i know women and african american people are not going to be accepted i don't think that is likely because in saru right now we already have affirmative action program for example because you know if the society if the university is that pragmatic they already reject them in the very first place i don't think that these uh, this argument really makes sense and they 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 they're, 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 they also never really characterize what is the utility of having more so, more social humanity graduates they can, they they even have not characterized the process if one hu social humanity graduate can suddenly create changes suddenly african american and woman is going to be protected their argument about changing the society attitude to become more protective towards minority because we have more social humanity graduate is still uncertain because of a lot of externalities but we told you that when you want to solve the problem of you know general issue like climate change or welfare you need to learn it through the, the university they their response only talk about if you are science uh, graduate you can still work in bank but it's only minor cases how can you become you know you know accountant a graduate but you need to solve the problem of climate changes or how you need to solve the problem of negotiating warfare their response is only attacking some portion of our you know argument therefore in our side of the house protecting more people still makes sense second argument about individual agency because they talk about some people have informed rational choices because they believe that it's okay for me to not get employed we we already responded by saying that not all people have informed rational choices in deciding the kind of faculty and university that they want to attend into because advertisement of, of university that only capitalized on one successful alumni instead of revealing the whole overall employability rate that makes them misled in terms of their judgment but second of all we already even traded off some people have choice to go to the humanity study because they can bear the consequences of not getting employed which is a privilege argument to begin with we are going to protect more people on the ground because there are a lot of people that want to go to courses that are going to give them more employability but they don't they don't have enough seats it means less people are going to get employed in their side of the house this argument is much more important instead of the virtue of agency and value of uh, you know individual choices because the utility of you having money it means that you can have better future better sustainability giving you know feeding your family having more disposable income to protect about more people on the ground at least in our side of the house to protect more people instead of the, their side that only talk specifically about minority thank you so much for that speech thank you so much for you know, so that amazing debate uh,